Um, okay, I think I can start the introduction. So um, welcome everyone to this session of the virtual seminars uh, in economic theory. And today we have a great pleasure of welcoming Mira Frick from Yale. Um, the title of the talk is Welfare Comparisons for Biased Learning. This is a joint work with Yota Ijima, who is with us today in the audience as well, and Yuta Ishii. Uh, we also have a great pleasure of having two guest panelists with us, Tristan Gagnon Barch and Jakub Steiner. Um, the talk is 60 minutes, our usual format. We reserve 15 minutes uh, after that for a Q&A session. Uh, on top of that, the talk is recorded. But after the hour, one hour and 15 minutes, uh, we are going to stop the recording and everyone is welcome to stay for a few more minutes to just infor chat informally. Um, please ask questions in the chat if there's anything that uh, that that can be typed easily, and uh, Mira's uh, co-author will will uh, keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, but if something needs to be clarified, please also unmute yourself and and uh, ask directly. Let me also remind you about our next talk. Uh, next week, we have Andy Skripach from Stanford, Stanford uh, uh, Graduate School of Business uh, talking about persuasion with multiple actions. And that's going to be next, next week. Okay, Mira, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the uh, well, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, for having me. Um, so as mentioned, uh, Lyota is on Zoom, happy to answer questions there. And thank you so much to Jakob and, and Tristan for serving as discussants today. Um, so this paper, we're currently still revising. It's been taking a bit longer than we had hoped, um, but hopefully very soon there'll be a new uh, version of the paper up on our websites. Okay, so a growing literature in behavioral economics studies various ways in which uh, people's learning uh, deviates from correct Bayesian uh, updating. Uh, experimental work uh, has documented and estimated many systematic such learning biases, uh, including, for example, overconfidence, under or overreaction to signals, correlation neglect, and many others. And such learning biases matter uh, because they can come to bear on many important economic uh, decision problems, ranging from career choices to financial investments and voting, uh, by leading to inefficient uh, choices. Now, the question we ask in this paper is how we might go about comparing the welfare costs of different learning biases, and importantly, how to do so robustly. That is uh, reflecting the fact that these uh, biases can come to bear on a wide range of economic problems. We seek comparisons that hold uniformly across decision uh, problems, in particular, independently of the specific uh, choice sets uh, agents might face and of their utilities, for example, their risk preferences. So, more concretely, uh, given a true signal distribution, our main results in this paper characterize when the objective expected payoffs under some learning bias one are lower than under a bias two in all decision problems. And so specifically, we uh, uh, address this characterization in two different ways. Uh, first, as really more of a benchmark, uh, we consider a static welfare ranking where we compare the expected payoffs after just one signal observation. And so this will yield a fairly partial order over learning biases that is characterized by comparing the interim beliefs after each signal realization under the different biases. We then contrast this with our main focus, which is on a dynamic welfare ranking. And so here we compare the expected payoffs assuming that agents have access to a large number of signal observations. And so as we'll see, this ranking can be characterized by means of an efficiency index that quantifies the speed of learning under each bias. And this will then yield a complete ranking over a relatively rich class of learning biases. 
Now, in carrying out these characterizations, uh, the key ingredients of our analysis are going to be to understand how different learning biases affect agents' short and medium run beliefs and their speed of belief convergence. And so we view this as kind of complementing a, a large uh, recent theoretical literature that has focused mostly on understanding how different learning biases affect agents' asymptotic beliefs. Um, we apply our results to provide welfare-founded comparisons of the severity of various uh, well-documented biases, uh, both across different degrees of the same bias, for example, different parametrizations of overreaction or overconfidence, uh, but also across qualitatively different biases, for example, uh, comparing the effect of correlation neglect across different sources versus the effect of neglecting some sources completely. Uh, in addition, our analysis uh, provides, uh, gives rise to several, uh, we think, interesting general implications. Uh, in particular, we'll see that the static and dynamic welfare rankings can disagree, meaning that some learning biases may be robustly more harmful when agents have access to little data, but robustly less harmful when agents have access to uh, lots of data, uh, rich data. Uh, relatedly, we'll see that certain uh, seemingly large biases can in fact be dynamically less harmful than other seemingly vanishingly small biases. And finally, time permitting, I'll consider an extension where agents learn not only about some payoff relevant state, but also try to learn about the underlying signal distribution. And here we'll see that uh, correctly specified agents can in fact be worse off than misspecified agents. Okay, to make all of this a little bit more concrete, uh, let me kind of illustrate our exercise and preview some of our implications in the context of a simple uh, example, uh, asymmetric under and over reaction. Um, so here we have a decision maker who tries to learn about her own ability, uh, theta, which uh, let's say is either low theta lower bar or high theta upper bar. And so specifically, she learns by having access to TIID draws of some signals, which are also binary, uh, low or high, uh, about her ability, where the high signal uh, is more indicative of the high state. Now, in updating her beliefs, PT following each uh, signal, uh, she departs from standard correct Bayesian updating in the following simple way. So instead of multiplying her prior belief ratio by the correct uh, likelihood ratio of the high state versus the low state under the signal realization, she's going to distort this likelihood ratio by some power, strictly positive power C, uh, where this uh, distortion might depend on the signal that was observed. So if this distortion factor C is just constantly equal to one, then we're in the case of standard correct Bayesian updating. By allowing C to be either less than or greater than one, this model can capture that the agent under or overreacts to some signals where this under and overreaction can be asymmetric across different signals. So for example, one natural case is where the distortion factor of the high signal is greater than that of the low signal. This can be interpreted as capturing um, some form of ego biased belief updating where the agent uh, reacts more strongly to positive signals about her ability than to negative signals. So the uh, experimental literature has documented and estimated this type of bias and uh, in particular estimated distortion functions for different subjects. But a difficulty in interpreting such findings is that it's perhaps not uh, ex ante clear how to interpret the severity of a given distortion function. So how should we compare the severity of two different distortion functions, C1 and C2? These are two dimensional objects. It's not necessarily clear how we might rank these. And so in the context of this example, our analysis is, go is going to enable us to provide a welfare founded answer to this question. In particular, we're going to assume that after observing these T uh, signal draws, uh, the decision maker faces some decision problem. Let's say, for example, career choice, 
where her payoff to each action depends on her ability, and she chooses optimally given her uh, subjective belief um, that she's formed after those T signals. And so to evaluate the severity, to compare the severity of these different distortions, we're going to characterize when the objective ex ante expected payoff under distortion one exceeds that under distortion two for all decision problems. Where here by objective, I mean that we're taking the perspective of some uh, outside observer who's going to evaluate these ex ante expected payoffs according to the true signal probabilities. Just a quick question. You mentioned yeah. um, uh, the empirical literature has estimated these um, the mm -hmm. C2 and C1. Um, connecting to that, does your ranking, you know, imagine those experiments uh, have people make some decisions and yeah. you can see how how much they earn in the experiment. Mm -hmm. um, does your ranking track kind of how much people earn in those experiments? Like people who have a C1 or C2 that you would rank as being um, uh, leading right. to high so, welfare, do those lead to more payoffs? Yes, yes. So there would, the, those should lead to more payoffs in, in the decision problem that's that's faced after. So we won't say you know exactly what the payoffs are, but we will be able to say the payoffs under more severe uh, distortions are going to be worse than under less severe ones. Right, right. I, I guess I was asking, in the experimental data that you were referring to. Does oh, that does it track that? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, we haven't checked that. We sh we probably should. So uh, in principle, that should be the case. Yes, unless the decision okay. makers are making some additional mistakes corresponding to you know violations of expected utility maximization or right. something. But but otherwise, Got yes, it. that should be the case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Yep. Okay. So then in the context of the simple example, our results are going to imply the following uh, answers to this question. So first, if we consider the static uh, ranking, um, so here uh, we're assuming the decision maker observes just one signal draw. So in that case, uh, in all decision problems, uh, the decision maker is going to be better off under distortion one than distortion two, if and only if for every single signal, um, the uh, distortion under C2 is more severe than under C1 in the sense that C1 is C1 of X is sandwiched in between one and C2 of X, where the sandwiching can go in either direction. In contrast, uh, based on the dynamic mm -hmm. ranking, uh, we'll see that um, for all decision problems and whenever the number of signal observations T is sufficiently large, the decision maker is going to be better off under C1 than C2, if and only if the ratio of the high signal distortion versus low signal distortion under uh, C1 is closer to one mm -hmm. than under C2. Uh, Mira, just a, just yep. a clarifying uh, remark. So you do assume uh, that your agents are Bayesian. They, mm -hmm. they have wrong belief about the signal generating process, but with respect to that wrong belief, they are Bayesian. And so, uh, so that's just a clarifying remark. And then a, a, a question. In principle, they they don't have to be Bayesian, and perhaps they they shouldn't. They they could mitigate some of the uh, wrongdoing on, on on their wrong beliefs by by using some other decision procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's ruled out. But is it something worth thinking about? Or I see, I see. So uh, you mean that they they should not do Bayesian updating? Yeah, perhaps. Um, so um, yeah, if I were yeah. evolution and my guy was pretty bad at uh, assessing the signal generation process, I would select a guy who would not be using a Bayesian rule. Right. To, right. to partially mitigate for the for the mm -hmm. misspecified belief. Yeah, yeah. So, so I should clarify. So, I think um, this will become much clearer when I get to the general model. But so, this this particular bias is a case that we would consider non-Bayesian in the sense that this cannot be necessarily replicated by Bayesian updating under some probabilistic perception of signal likelihood. So, it will be important to capture this under overreaction bias that the signal likelihoods are not necessarily probabilistic. So, in that sense, it's already a bit of a departure from from Bayesian updating. But I completely take your point that in spirit, this is still very much Bayesian updating under some incorrect uh, view of the, of the signal likelihoods. Um, 
And so, so yeah, so I think it's, it's, it would be very interesting to, to generalize beyond this case of, of uh, Bayesian updating. Our analysis in particular for the dynamic welfare ranking will rely quite heavily on some sort of structure similar to Bayes rules. So in particular, what we're going to need is that as T grows large, the empirical signal frequencies are a sufficient statistic for how agents update their beliefs. And so and there are some forms of uh, non-Bayesian updating that might be uh, violated. And so we, we just can't say anything about um, how to analyze welfare. But I think that's that's a super interesting point to make to to see how um, some forms of non-Bayesianism might might actually imp- might mitigate uh, certain certain biases. Um, we don't address it in the current paper. Yeah. Arda had a question, but he lowered his Yeah, I have a quick clarification question. So the definition of a decision problem here involves x, x upper bar and x lower bar, right? Uh, so those are signals. The decision problem I haven't made very explicit so far. That's just going to be, you know, you face some set of uh, actions, possible actions that generate utilities that depend on the state. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and so, so yeah. So, so then comparing. Um, so, so by just looking at these these uh, results for the static and dynamic ranking, we can immediately illustrate some of the general implications I, I highlighted earlier. So, in particular, note that the static and dynamic rankings can disagree. So, consider, for instance, any um, uh, distortion C two that's symmetric but a very strong underreaction. Say, in this case, point one. Um, and compare that to a distortion C1 that also features underreaction, but to a much milder degree, only 0.9 for the high signal and 0.8 for the, for the low signal, um, but in an asymmetric way. Then based on the static ranking, this milder uh, form of underreaction is going to outperform um, the, the more severe C2 in all decision problems. Uh, in contrast, based on the dynamic ranking, because this ratio uh, of the symmetric underreaction is exactly one, that's going to dominate uh, the that's going to robustly outperform uh, this asymmetric underreaction C1 in all decision problems. So, so which one is worse is really going to depend on how much data the agent has access to. Um, so very relatedly to this point. Um, more generally, we'll see that uh, small but asymmetric uh, distortions, um, so e- even vanishingly small such distortions, are uh, dynamically worse than large but symmetric uh, distortions. And then finally, let me also note that uh, both these rankings that we obtain here, the static and the dynamic ranking, uh, can be inconsistent or disagree uh, with some perhaps more ad hoc uh, measures of severity that are sometimes used in applied work. For instance, we saw that in some papers they use uh, the difference between these distortion factors as a way of quantifying severity. And so this turns out not to be welfare founded. More severity and measured by this will not necessarily mean worse payoffs. Um, one question, Mira, yeah. about the previous slides. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm understanding this correctly, but uh, intuitively, um, the, as- the asymmetry that leads to dynamically lower welfare, is it because that because we have this ratio and somehow in the long run it gets powered to a large time? And so if it's not one, then this ratio either gets really large or it gets really small. Um, yeah, so so I'll, I'll talk a lot more about about this disagreement between the static and the dynamic and why the ratio matters later. But intuitively, um, the what's what's happening is that there's some sort of canceling out effect of of different uh, errors. So here, the agent is underreacting to both signals, but she's doing so in a symmetric way, and we'll see that that cancels out in exactly the right way to make uh, dynamic welfare uh, uh, the highest it can possibly be. Whereas if you underreact asymmetrically to different signals, you won't get this canceling out effect. But I'll, I'll go into much more detail uh, later in the talk on that. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. There's also another question from Sergio, but Mira, feel free to... Uh, yeah, I, maybe I'll just time. move on to the model now because I feel like many questions might be resolved as soon as we we see the general model. Sergio, um, maybe you can ask in the in the chat. Yeah, or in the chat. I'm sure Leota or, or is happy to. Q&A. Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So beyond this uh, uh, simple example, then as this is the general setting we consider. Um, so we consider a setting with a finite set of states theta, where the true state is drawn from from some full support prior p zero. 
Uh, for today's talk, uh, I'm going to focus just on the case of binary states, uh, high state and low state. Uh, this is mostly for simplicity. In the paper, we generalize our main results beyond this case. Um, there's a finite set of signals x, and so a signal sequence x1, x2 up to xt is drawn iid according to some true signal structure mu. So here mu theta denotes the true signal distribution uh, conditional on the state being theta, uh, and we assume this, uh, this to be full support, and we assume that different states induce different signal distributions. Now to capture a uh, biased learning, we're going to consider a decision maker um, who has the correct prior belief over states. This is not important, this is just for simplicity, but whose perceived signal structure, who perceives the signal structure to be mu hat, which might be different from mu. So more specifically in each state theta, uh, the decision maker's perceived signal likelihoods uh, are going to be given by this strictly positive vector mu hat uh, theta. And so while we assume that these perceived signal likelihoods are strictly positive, we don't necessarily require them to be probabilities. They don't have to sum up to one. And as I alluded to, and we'll discuss in a moment uh, in more detail, this allows us to accommodate both uh, misspecified Bayesian uh, learning as kind of the leading special case, but also some forms of non-Bayesian learning. And so the decision maker in this case is correctly specified if her perceived signal structure mu hat matches the true one. And so after observing uh, the sequence of T signal draws, then the decision maker forms a posterior belief PT according to Bayes' rule, as discussed with Jakob, but under her perceived signal structure mu hat. So she applies Bayes' rule, but using her perceived signal structure mu hat instead of the true one. And so let me just briefly uh, discuss kind of the scope and limitations of this model of, of biased learning. So as mentioned, as our leading special case, we have in mind uh, Bayesian learning with misspecification. So this corresponds to the case where the perceived signal distribution mu hat theta in each state is a probability distribution. And as is well known, um, this misspecified Bayesian learning is a very useful framework to capture many different forms of uh, behavioral learning biases. Uh, for example, over precision, where the perceived signal structure is more informative than the true signal structure, uh, conversely under precision, or overconfidence, where signals are linearly ordered and the perceived signal distribution in each state first order stochastically dominates the true signal distribution and many others. Uh, one noteworthy special case is when the signal space takes a product structure uh, where we can think of each component K here as representing a different information source. So in this case, uh, misspecified Bayesian learning can capture uh, biases such as correlation misperception, for example, where the agent neglects the correlation uh, across the different uh, sources relative to the true signal distribution, or inattention where the agent uh, misperceives uh, the signals from some sources to be uninformative, uh, given uh, the signals from the other sources, uh, course reasoning or pooling, where the decision maker uh, divides uh, the sources into analogy classes, and so in performing yeah, just, yeah. just just a clarification yeah. you do not mean serial correlations you do assume id yeah. but my suspicion is that actually you could accommodate uh serial correlations and misunderstanding of that by, by your method some sounds doable to me exactly uh, exactly yeah so we have a companion so yeah so you're exactly right so in the current paper we're just assuming that signals are drawn iid where here the signals are just multi-dimensional and so correlation is across dimensions not across draws uh, but we have a companion note where we address the case of uh, serially correlated signals and misperceptions thereof. Um, yeah, so, so, so this is kind of a wide variety of biases we can accommodate within the misspecified Bayesian framework. But then as noted, because we allow uh, signal like perceived signal likelihoods to not necessarily be probabilistic, 
we can also accommodate some classes of, of uh, non bayesian learning. So under this uh, category uh, falls the illustrative example of asymmetric under or over reaction, where perceived likelihood uh, ratios are uh, scaled up by some power uh, C of X relative to the truth. Um, a very related bias is partisan bias, where perceived uh, likelihood ratios are distorted multiplicatively in the direction of one state um, and some related biases. Um, at the same time, as, as already mentioned by Jakob, um, because we focus on the simple um, uh, benchmark of exogenous IID signals, we do rule out um, the case that there's a correlation either in the true or perceived uh, signal distributions across draws. Uh, so this rules out some biases such as, say, the gambler's fallacy, but uh, we extend to this framework in a companion note. Uh, what we also rule out is that true or perceived uh, signal distributions are uh, in, depend endogenously on the current belief. So this would be important in capturing um, uh, things like active learning or experimentation, where signals are the result of actions that are chosen depending on the current belief, or belief-dependent updating biases such as confirmation bias. Uh, again, we extend to, to partly extend to, to this uh, framework in, in a companion note. And then finally, as I already discussed earlier, so it is important that we're applying Bayes' rule uh, under this perceived signal structure. And so this does rule out some important uh, forms of non-Bayesian learning in particular, uh, for, for instance, the case where uh, belief updating displays order effects, so where it matters in which order signals appeared instead of just what the signal sequence was. Just to clarify, I suppose yeah. this also rules out um, biases in memory. If I just happen to only hold, I don't know, K signals in my head at one time, I suppose this would be ruled out as well. Right, right. So I think for the static ranking, it really wouldn't matter. But for the dynamic sure, sure, ranking sure. with many signal draws, that, that would be ruled out because we're going to be focused on uh, biases that will lead beliefs to converge to point mass beliefs. And so if, if you only remember K signal draws, that, that won't happen. Yeah. Okay. What about a case where memory decays, but not, um, I guess, beliefs could converge in that case? But I, I see, I see. Um... Yeah, I would have to think about how that would be modeled. Yeah, I, I, I don't think know probably either, but... still. Yeah, I, I would speculate that the empirical frequency won't be a sufficient statistic in that case, in which case our methods won't apply. Right. But maybe there are some ways of, of writing it so that it could be done. Sure. Um, Thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you for, for all these questions. Um, okay, and so then, you know, after updating beliefs, according to this uh, biased learning rule, the decision maker faces a decision problem which for our purposes is just a finite set A of utility acts. So what's a utility act? It's a vector in R theta, where you should think of A theta as capturing the decision maker's utility to this action A in state theta. So note that decision problems simultaneously summarize both the action set and the utilities. And just to avoid trivialities, we assume that A does not contain a, a dominant act. And so after observing the signal sequence X1 through XT, uh, the decision maker then chooses an act A uh, to maximize her subjective expected payoff based on her updated belief PT. Uh, for simplicity, we assume that uh, this admits a unique solution. So I'm just going to completely ignore indifferences throughout this talk. And so to compare uh, different biases, then what we're going to be interested in is the decision maker's objective welfare uh, under each learning bias. I'm going to denote that by WT. And what we mean by that is the ex ante expected payoff to choosing, as I just specified here, when the probabilities over signal sequences are evaluated according to the true signal structure mu. And so our goal then is the following. So given a true signal structure mu, we're going to consider two different perceived signal structures, mu hat one and mu hat two. And we want to characterize when the objective welfare under mu hat one is higher than that under mu hat two at all decision problems. So for all action sets and utilities. 
where we're going to approach this in two different ways. Um, first, uh, by considering the static ranking, where we're going to consider objective welfare after one signal draw and require that to be higher under mu hat one than mu hat two for all decision problems. And then second, we're going to consider as our main focus, the dynamic welfare ranking, where we require a WT under mu hat one to exceed a WT under mu hat two, uh, for all decision problems and for all sufficiently large numbers T of signal draws. I think there was a question. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry to interrupt again. Um, oh, no. Just to clarify, this is a once and for all decision after capital T signals. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Would, have you thought about what would happen if the person took an action after every signal, like a sort of a dynamic decision yeah. problem? Yeah, 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 that's that's a very good question. So, so that will be um, tricky in the following sense. Um, so in that case, um, say we we um, consider this, this repeated decision problem. So, and we then, you know, discount, look at some discounted expected sum of the payoffs or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, our dynamic welfare ranking um, is going to consider kind of the rate at which mistakes vanish in decision problems or the rate at which beliefs converge to particular states. Um, that rate is going to be exponential, but the discounting itself is also exponential. So it's going to be tricky to kind of uh, balance out these two, two forces. So we, we don't have I anything see. to say about, about that case, but I think it would be an interesting uh, okay. extension okay. to look at. And yeah, yeah. perhaps I one guess. can do something with sufficiently large discount factor or something. But uh, Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And to add to the trickiness, I suppose you'd also have to consider a broader class of decision problems because you could also have dynamic decision problems where you know if the, if the bias interacted with how you make decisions yeah. over time that could get pretty complicated right right so right. i think as a first step it would probably make sense to keep the signal structure exogenous right, right, right. um but in this in this companion note i mentioned we do something a bit more along the lines you just mentioned so we consider biases that depend on the current belief we don't explicitly model actions for this as relevant but you might think of that as resulting from an agent taking an action in the background that generates the signals. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And so I think just to put this in perspective, sort of one way of thinking of this exercise is as similar in spirit to the classic exercise of ranking information structures going back to Blackwell. So there, what, what we're interested in is comparing a decision maker's objective welfare um, uh, uh, under two different true signal structures, mu1 and mu2, assuming that the decision maker is correctly specified. Whereas what we're doing in the current paper is we're fixing a true signal structure and we're comparing welfare under two different learning biases or perceived signal structures. Um, uh, and, and so the analog of our static ranking would kind of be Blackwell's classic uh, ranking over information structures. The analog of our dynamic ranking was analyzed by Moscarini-Smith in the context of ranking experiments. Okay, so let's then proceed to analyze uh, these welfare rankings. And so just quickly as a benchmark, let's look at the static uh, welfare ranking. Um, so to state our characterization result, uh, we're going to consider signal likelihood ratios. So let L of X denote the true likelihood ratio of the high state versus the low state under signal X. And let L hat of I denote the perceived likelihood ratio of the uh, high state versus low state uh, under uh, perceived signal structure mu hat I. So then our characterization says the following. Uh, suppose for each signal X, uh, the perceived likelihood ratio under uh, mu hat one is in between the correct one L of X and that under L hat two. Uh, under mu hat two, where the sandwiching can go either way. Then um, the welfare after just one signal draw under bias one will exceed that under bias two in all decision problems uh, where this inequality will be strict uh, whenever the chosen acts are different after some signal realizations. And moreover, we also have a converse of this result uh, where we impose an additional monotonicity condition on the true and perceived signal structures. Um, this will be satisfied in all the examples in today's talk, um, so I won't go into the details here. Um, and so the way to interpret this condition then um, in terms of these nested uh, likelihood ratios is to say that 
um, what this requires is that the interpretation of each signal under mu hat one is less is is closer to correctly specified than uh, that under bias mu hat two. And so if we go back to the asymmetric under overreaction from the uh, example from the beginning, where the perceived likelihood ratios are distorted by uh, this uh, power CI of X, we get exactly what I previewed in the introduction, that um, the decision maker is going to be better off under C1 than under C2, if and only if for each X, uh, C1 distorts uh, X less than C2. Now, in learning settings, it's natural to think that agents have access not just to one signal draw, but to many signal draws. And so our main focus is going to be on this dynamic welfare ranking. And so uh, note first that if asymptotic beliefs are different under two biases, mu hat one and mu hat two, then it's straightforward to see how the dynamic welfare ranking plays out just by considering these differences in asymptotic beliefs. However, note that there are many different learning biases that give rise to the same asymptotic beliefs. In particular, in a coarse state space, binary state space, as we're considering here, there are really only a very limited number of possible uh, asymptotic beliefs. And so many, many biases are going to give rise to the same asymptotic beliefs. And so the key challenge is going to be, how do we rank dynamic welfare when two biases have the same, give rise to the same asymptotic beliefs? And so to illustrate how we address this challenge today in the talk, I'm going to focus on comparing uh, mu hat one and mu hat two, for which the asymptotic beliefs are almost surely a point mass on the true state, so are almost surely correct. So this is going to happen whenever the misperceptions are not too large, in the sense that they satisfy the following consistency condition, which says that the true signal distribution in each state theta comes closer to the agent's perceived signal distribution in the true state theta than it comes to the perceived signal distribution in any other state theta prime, where closeness is measured in terms of KL divergence, which is a standard measure for how atypical some observed signal distribution nu is relative to some reference uh, distribution, new prime. And so at, at this point, when I was looking at it, uh, it was useful for me, Mira, to recall the general results of Berk and White on misspecified yeah. learning. This is the condition that you refer to. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I was not explicit about that. So asymptotic beliefs in the setting are pinned down um, by standard results due to going back to Berk. In particular, these results say that the decision maker's asymptotic belief is going to concentrate on the state uh, that comes closest to matching the empirical uh, signal frequency the decision maker observes. And since this uh, long run empirical signal uh, frequency is almost surely going to concentrate around the true signal distribution mu theta, uh, this implies what I just said. So you're going to concentrate on the true state if your perceived signal distribution better in the true state better explains the true signal distribution than the perceived signal distribution in any other state. Exactly, exactly. Okay, and so we'll see in a moment then that in this case where asymptotic beliefs are correct under uh, the two biases, the dynamic welfare ranking is going to be characterized by means of a learning efficiency index that quantifies the speed at which the decision maker converges to these uh, correct long run beliefs. Um, now, let me just note that while I'm going to focus on this case of correct asymptotic beliefs in the presentation, um, similar arguments apply if asymptotic beliefs under the two biases are incorrect, but the same. Um, the only difference is essentially going to be that now in states in which mislearning occurs, so you converge to some incorrect state, uh, we're going to want learning efficiency to be lower because this will ensure that beliefs converge more slowly to this incorrect long run belief. Okay, so what is this learning efficiency index? And this is perhaps the key definition of the paper. Um, so given any true signal structure mu and perceived uh, signal structure mu hat, we're going to define the learning efficiency index as follows. So first consider any given state theta. There we're going to define this index W theta, which is given by considering the lowest possible KL divergence 
we can achieve between some signal distribution mu and the true signal distribution in state theta. Subject to the restriction that we're going to restrict attention to signal distributions nu that come equally close in terms of KL divergence to the perceived signal distribution in the low state and in the high state. And I'm going to refer to this condition as the indistinguishability condition. And we're then going to define the learning efficiency index W by just taking the worst case of these uh, state-based indices. Okay, so, so yeah, let me uh, interpret this a little bit. Let me help you pass this. So the way to think about this is as follows. So we're going to think of this new here as the realized empirical signal distribution that the decision maker observes. So this keeps track of the fraction of each signal that the decision maker has observed after a certain number of signal draws. And so note then that if this observed empirical signal distribution satisfies our indistinguishability condition, this means that based on observing new, the decision maker is unable to tell apart the two states. This is because nu is equally atypical relative to the perceived uh, signal distributions in the low state and in the high state. And so what this index W theta now measures is how atypical such confusing uh, empirical distributions nu that don't allow the decision maker to distinguish the two states are relative to the true signal distribution mu theta in state theta. So, so the low, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. When I was reading this, it was yeah. useful for me to kind of see that these indexes in each state will be equal to the rate at which the probability of an error in each state decays, and that has to do with Sun of theorem. So maybe you plan to work on that. Yeah, I plan. I plan to okay, say so more maybe about that in just I a moment. Shut up yeah. And, and, and don't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. But that's that's exactly the right the right intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah, so the lower this index W theta, the more atypical, so, sorry, the, the less atypical it is um, to observe such confusing signal distributions new. So the more likely it is in some sense that the decision maker is going to be unable to distinguish the two states. Um, and then finally, the overall learning efficiency index considers the worst case measure across uh, all these uh, State. So in focusing, in characterizing learning efficiency, we're going to be focusing on the states, on the state where it's most likely to observe confusing empirical signal distributions. Okay, and so here's then our, our main result, or our first main result, which says that this learning efficiency index exactly characterizes uh, the dynamic welfare ranking. Um, so fix any true signal uh, structure mu and perceived uh, signal structures mu hat one and mu hat two satisfying consistency. And suppose that mu hat one has a higher learning efficiency index than mu hat two. Uh, then for all decision problems A, there exists some large enough number T star of signal draws such that if the decision maker observes more than T signal draws, then her welfare is going to be strictly higher under mu hat one than under mu hat two. So this result is saying that uh, this efficiency index provides a complete ranking across all consistent biases, uh, except for kind of the knife edge case where these learning efficiency indices are exactly tied. And note that this is worth contrasting with the static ranking, which was, which was highly incomplete. I didn't say it at the time, but this, the static condition is of course a very demanding condition. Okay, and so now exactly along the lines as, as Jakob already foresaw, let me tell you a little bit where this result is coming from. And so here the idea is the following. Um, so since we're restricting attention to uh, biases that lead to correct asymptotic beliefs, this means that as T grows large, uh, the decision maker is going to choose suboptimally in any given decision problem with probability approaching zero. So as a result, in comparing uh, dynamic welfare across two biases, what we're going to care about is how unlikely it is at large T to have this very unlikely event, uh, how likely it is at large T to still have this very unlikely event that the decision maker makes a mistake. 
And so using arguments from large deviation theory, which allows us to say how fast such unlikely events decay, we're going to show that this efficiency index in state theta is exactly the rate at which the mistake probabilities vanish in state theta. And so let's, let's just uh, look at this a little bit more closely to see the idea here. And so for this, we're going to think in terms of which empirical signal distributions mu t are going to induce mistakes um, after a certain number t of signal draws. And so by the arguments we talked about earlier, by, by Burke in particular, um, since beliefs are going to concentrate on states that come closest to explaining uh, the empirical signal distributions based on the decision maker's perceived signal distribution, mistakes are going to occur whenever the empirical signal distribution comes closer to the decision maker's perceived signal distribution in the wrong state, theta prime, than it does to the uh, perceived signal distribution in the true state, theta. So in this uh, picture here, um, I'm showing these problematic mistake-inducing empirical distributions in gray here. So we have the perceived signal distribution in the true state, mu theta here, perceived signal distribution in the other state, mu theta prime here. And so all these uh, distributions uh, in this gray region come closer to mu hat theta prime than to mu theta. And so if the decision maker observes uh, an empirical distribution in this gray region, she's going to be in trouble because she's going to make a mistake. But now note that there are many such uh, empirical distributions in this gray region. And so the key insight based on large deviation theory is going to be that we don't need to consider all these possible uh, empirical signal distributions in the gray region. Rather, all that's going to matter is those empirical distributions that come closest to the true signal distribution mu theta. Why is that? Well, that reflects what's known as the large deviation principle, which is formalized by Sarnoff's theorem, which says that when an unlikely event occurs, in this case, the event that the decision maker observes one of these, uh, these mistake-inducing empirical signal distributions, it is still overwhelmingly likely to occur in the least atypical way. And the least atypical way in which the decision maker can make a mistake here is by observing one of these empirical uh, distributions in this dashed region, which are closest to the true signal distribution in state theta. But now what are these empirical distributions that come closest to the true signal distribution? Well, because we're assuming consistency here, because we're assuming that um, mu hat theta comes closer to mu theta than, than does mu hat theta prime, this dashed region here corresponds exactly to the indistinguishability condition. So it corresponds exactly uh, to the empirical signal distributions that make the decision maker unable to distinguish state theta and state theta prime. And so that's then where our result comes from, that the rate at which mistakes vanish is given by how unlikely these empirical distributions are that make the two states indistinguishable. So just in, in words, kind of the key implication of this result is that while in general, the decision maker could be making two different kinds of mistakes, uh, she could be making mistakes where she observes empirical signal distributions that are highly indicative of the wrong state, or she could be making mistakes uh, where she observes empirical distributions that make her unable to distinguish the two states. What matters is the latter kind of mistake, only the ones that make her unable to distinguish the two states, not, not the case where she becomes very convinced in the wrong state. And so finally, then um, the ex ante welfare loss is going to be determined by looking at the state in which mistakes are most likely, or in other words, by taking the minimum over these uh, uh, efficiency indices. And, and I, I think here it may be worth to emphasize that since mistakes vanish exponentially with the time horizon, you don't really care about the how much of utility you, you lose that all is kind of a second order and just exactly. the minimum because they're comparing exponential functions. And exactly, the, exactly, right. exactly. That's that's exactly right. And that's also where, where this minimum over states comes from. So we don't care about what the prior was, which states are more likely or anything or how large the losses are in different states. All we care about is in which state we're most likely to make mistakes. 
Okay, perfect. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind our main theorem. Let me now go back um, to uh, the illustrative example and see why, why it gives us this ratio uh, of distortion factors. Um, and so the key implication of this result is that when we want to analyze the effect of a given uh, learning bias on welfare, on dynamic welfare, all that we need to look at is really how this bias affects the indistinguishability condition. So how it affects which empirical distributions make the two states indistinguishable for the agent. And so what was this indistinguishability condition? Well, this was saying um, nu comes equally close to mu hat theta lower bar than to uh, as it does to mu hat theta upper bar. But if you stare at this for, for a moment, this is equivalent to just looking at a, a hyperplane which is given by uh, all empirical distributions nu uh, with normal vector uh, given by the perceived log likelihood ratios of each signal. Um, so we want nu um, dot this normal vector to be zero. And now under this asymmetric under or over reaction example, the perceived log likelihood ratio is just the true log likelihood ratio multiplied by this distortion factor. So really what fully determines um, the, uh, the uh, indistinguishability condition under the, uh, under the um, uh, asymmetric under overreaction is this vector of distortions C1 and C2. Uh, so C1, C1 of X upper bar and C1 of X lower bar. And so as a result, the dynamic welfare ranking then only depends on the ratio of these two distortions because that determines this, this normal vector. And so in particular, uh, as is shown here in this figure, um, the, the welfare ranking is described as follows. So it's, it's described by the single peaked uh, efficiency index, which uh, achieves its maximum at one. So where, this, where the distortions exactly cancel out. And then the further away we move from one, uh, the lower is dynamic welfare under, under this uh, asymmetric updating example. Okay, so let me then also talk briefly about some of these general implications of our result. Um, and so the first point is uh, this point that the static and dynamic rankings can disagree, meaning that the decision maker can be robustly worse off uh, in all decision problems under bias mu hat one uh, if she faces just one signal draw, limited data, but she can be strictly better off in all decision problems if she faces uh, a lot of data. Um, so we saw this already in the context of the asymmetric updating example. And let me highlight that this is one important distinction between our exercise and what happens in the comparison of information structures literature. So there, if you have two experiments, one of which Blackwell dominates the other, then any number of signal draws from the dominant experiment is also going to be better than any number of signal draws from the less dominant experiment. So there you don't get these reversals. But here we get these reversals between the static and dynamic uh, rankings. And so where are they coming from? So the general idea that our two results are formalizing is that for the static ranking, we really require uh, the interpretation of each individual signal to be closer to correctly specified under, under the less harmful bias. In contrast, for the dynamic ranking, what matters is just how much the bias shifts the indistinguishability condition. And this is just reflected by how much the bias affects the relative interpretations of different signals. Uh, as is captured by this vector of log likelihood ratios. And so in particular, the effect that can then arise is that we can get uh, two uh, uh, opposite errors uh, to cancel out when it comes to the relative interpretations of, of different signals. So in the case of asymmetric updating, what happens is that if these two distortion factors are symmetric, then you're going to be um, underreacting too much and uh, underreacting in the direction of the high state following high signals, underreacting in the direction of the low state following low signals. But when it comes to evaluating signal sequences that consist of both low and high signals, these two mistakes are going to exactly cancel out and you're going to be interpreting them the same way as a correctly specified agent would. Whereas if these distortions are asymmetric, um, then they don't uh, cancel out in this way. 
Okay, another implication uh, closely related to this is that um, certain uh, large biases uh, can dynamically outperform other even vanishingly small biases. Um, and so for this note first that um, uh, the uh, any any bias mu hat is going to be outperformed in terms of the efficiency index by uh, the correctly specified uh, model. But at the same time, there are some biases uh, that achieve the same efficiency as the correctly specified uh, agent. So we just saw this in the asymmetric updating example. The symmetric distortion um, is giving us the same learning efficiency one as the correctly specified model. But there's a more general result behind this. Um, so call a bias mu hat a Phillips Edwards bias if um, it can be written as uh, a distortion of log likelihood ratio uh, of likelihood ratios to some constant power c. So this is a generalization of the symmetric uh, 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 distortion example we just saw. Where here we're now allowing for arbitrary numbers of signals. And so what this result says is that it turns out that this bias is the unique maximally efficient learning bias. So for any mu and mu hat, the following are equivalent mu hat achieves maximal learning efficiency and mu hat is a Phillips Edwards bias of, of this form. And so relating this uh, then to the point that uh, large biases can outperform small biases, uh, note that if you take now any fixed Phillips Edwards bias, that will outperform any sequence of uh, non-Phillips Edwards biases, mu hat n, that approach the correctly specified model. May I model. perhaps have a motivation for the name of this, this class of biases? Oh, oh, yeah. So Phillips Edwards were the people. So this is a pair of authors who first studied this bias. Um, so this is a, a form of uh, under over-inference uh, model that, that goes back to Phillips and Edwards. Yeah, I should probably have said that. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so this any any Phillips Edwards bias will outperform any even vanishingly small non Phillips Edwards biases. Yeah, we have about five minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So then, I think for the rest of the talk, I'm not going to talk about the extension I previewed at the beginning. Instead, I'm just going to um, say a little bit more about a few other uh, examples we can we can address uh, using this framework. So I focused mostly on this illustrative example of asymmetric updating. Um, but as mentioned, our our framework applies to many other learning biases. And so let me maybe uh, shed light on some comparisons for other learning biases. And so the first I want to consider is the case of over versus under precision. Um, so for simplicity, let's focus again on, on a binary signal environment. And so let's consider a true signal structure where uh, the probability of the high signal is greater than a half in the high state, but less than a half in the low state. And so what does over precision then mean? Over precision means the perceived signal structure uh, is more informative than the true signal structure, which in this setting means that the perceived probability of the high signal in the high state is greater than actual, and the perceived probability of the uh, high signal in the low state is smaller than actual. Conversely, under precision means the perceived uh, signal structure is less uh, informative than the true signal structure, which means the perceived uh, probability of the high signal in the high state is less than actual, perceived probability of the uh, high signal in the low state is, is greater than actual. Now, based on the static ranking, our first uh, result implies that uh, any over-precision bias and under-precision bias are incomparable according to the static ranking. So if you give me any over-precision bias, any under-precision bias, there are always going to be some decision problems where after one signal draw, the over-precision bias performs better and others where the under-precision bias performs better. However, based on our dynamic ranking, we can compare any two biases here. Um, and in particular, in this case, what our dynamic ranking implies is that there is actually a range of over-precision biases that are going to be outperformed by every under-precision bias. And so the basic idea that is captured here is um, that we can see that the uh, learning efficiency index under over-precision can be arbitrarily close to zero, meaning that the rate of learning can be arbitrarily slow under over-precision. Whereas under under-precision, the learning efficiency is going to be bounded away from zero 
meaning that under precision can have only a limited effect on the speed of learning. So there are these qualitative differences between the two biases that do not emerge based on the based on considering just one signal draw that that but that become uh, important when one looks at many signal draws. Another example of a comparison between two qualitatively different uh, biases is the following. So here I'm going to consider um, an environment where the signal uh, space takes uh, a product structure representing two different signal sources, where I'll assume the, the sets of signals for the two sources are the same, Z. And I'm going to consider a true signal structure, mu, with symmetric marginals in each state. And so here I'm now going to compare the effect of correlation neglect, meaning that the perceived signal structure in each state uh, features the correct marginal signal distributions, but misperceives these to be independent. And we can compare this to the effect of what I'm going to call variable neglect, which is basically neglecting signals from one source. And formally, this can be captured by saying that the decision maker's perceived likelihood ratio uh, following any profile of signal Z1 and Z2 is going to be formed by using the correct marginal signal distribution for the first uh, signal source, for the first source, but just ignoring the uh, second source entirely. So here the decision maker correctly perceives uh, the marginal signal distribution for the first source, but misperceives the second source to be uninformative given the, given the first source and hence ignores it. Again, statically, these two biases can in general not be compared. But what we can show based on our results is that for any true signal structure mu, correlation neglect is going to have a strictly higher learning efficiency index than uh, variable neglect, meaning that based on the dynamic ranking, so when sufficiently many signals are observed, correlation neglect is always going to be less harmful than variable neglect. Now, if the true signal structure is actually independent or close to independent, this is probably very intuitive. In that case, uh, correlation neglect is not really much of a mistake, but variable neglect is a substantial mistake. But what this result says is that this is true no matter how correlated the sources are. So even when the sources are highly correlated, it's still less harmful to neglect their correlation than to ignore signals from one source entirely. Okay, um, so with uh, okay, so maybe let me want say one one more thing. Um, so we've we've seen then um, that based on our dynamic uh, welfare ranking, uh, we can compare uh, different learning biases uh, using the simple uh, learning efficiency index, and that this dynamic welfare ranking kicks in as long as uh, sufficiently many signals are observed, namely T star signals. But an important question that this then raises is just how many signals are really needed for our dynamic ranking to uh, apply. In particular, we already saw that the static and dynamic rankings can be inconsistent, so it sort of matters to know how large a T star can be. And so in the paper, we address this question by uh, deriving analytical bounds on uh, this number T star uh, and also on the resulting uh, welfare gap because you might be worried that if T star is very large, then both uh, under both biases, you'll be very close to having converged to the correct uh, long run belief. So this welfare gap will be minuscule. Um, but what our results show is that um, in fact, T star can be moderate and, and the welfare gap uh, can be large. Um, um, and so let me, instead of showing you the analytical results, just demonstrate this in the context of a, of a specific uh, decision problem. Um, so here we have a simple binary decision problem uh, where the first act gives payoff one in, in state one, payoff zero, otherwise the second act gives payoff two in, in the second state and zero in the first state, symmetric prior. And our true uh, signal structure um, is, is symmetric, so the probability of the high signal in the high state is 0.8, as is the probability uh, of the uh, low signal in the low state. And so let's compare here uh, two uh, biases. One is a, a asymmetric uh, updating bias uh, where you're underreacting to both signals, um, but more, uh, but less so to the high signal than the low signal. 
Um, and the second is a, is a Phillips Edwards bias, so a symmetric um, underreaction bias with a quite substantial underreaction uh, factor of 0.14. And so what I'm plotting in this figure here is the welfare uh, after a T uh, signal draws. And so here you'll see that um, consistent with our uh, first result, um, when you look at just uh, one signal draw, this uh, uh, asymmetric but mild bias shown here in orange outperforms the symmetric but severe bias. But after just seven signal draws, this reverses. And at that point, the um, asymmetric bias uh, takes over, uh, be be becomes dominant uh, relative to the symmetric bias. And indeed, the welfare under the asymmetric bias starts to track the true wealth uh, the, tr the welfare under under the correctly specified model very closely at, at so, moderate so, t may I, yeah. may I feel, feel free to skip if, if, if you mm -hmm. want to complete something else but since all the techniques that you have shown so far were asymptotic techniques yeah I wonder what kind of tricks you 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 use what kind of mathematical tools you use to derive the analytical bonds uh for for finite times yeah so so we we end up um still using the learning efficiency index so that's something i should probably have emphasized so it turns out that this analytical bound uh depends only on the gap in the learning efficiency across the two biases um but to to derive this bound this is more kind of combinatorial we can't we can't use large deviation techniques to to derive to, uh, this bound um and I should say, we don't do this for all possible decision problems. We focus on binary decision problems. So we, we do make some restrictions to make this tractable, but, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, so you see then that after just a relatively moderate number of signals, um, the, the dynamically better bias starts to outperform um, the, the, the dynamically worse bias and that the welfare gap is quite significant. So relative to the first best payoff, which here is 1.5, uh, we're at sort of close to 90% of that after 15 signal draws under the symmetric bias, but we remain very far from that under the asymmetric bias. Okay, so let me then just jump to the conclusion, um, or am I completely out of time? Then I can also stop <laughs> here. Um, um, just in, in a few words, because we probably would okay, like yeah, to so, leave so some let me time. Just, let me just put up the conclusion then and stop here. Sorry for going, going over time. No, I just wanted to, to make sure that we have enough time for, for Q&A. Uh, we still have, uh, well, quite quite a few minutes, but uh, shall we start with Jakub and Tristan uh, okay. for yeah. any, may, maybe you have any final questions or, uh, or, or comments at this stage. Tristan, you are muted already. Oh, I think I'm unmuted now. Sure. Um, so, yeah, just very broadly, I thought it was a really nice paper. Um, I thought it was interesting to see how uh, a lot of the analysis boils down to this uh, indistinguishability condition. Didn't really see that coming, but uh, it makes a lot of sense now that you explained it. So that's, uh, I thought it was uh, quite nice. It seems to be a useful tool and has some good insights. Um, one question that might give you a chance to talk about the slide that you just skipped uh, was on the motivating question is, are some learning biases more harmful than others? And I think that's a great question. One thing I was wondering about was, um, you know, you, you might think that biases that tend to be more costly might also be the ones that we might uh, figure out. So it would be really interesting to combine this with some of the ideas on the slide that you just skipped over where you talk about the, um, the uh, selection and survival of misspecifications. So um, it would be interesting if to know if there are some, I guess the, the most harmful type of bias is the type of bias that is costly and we don't figure it out. So mm -hmm. by some of these metrics, maybe um, the sort of bias that would persist or, uh, so I guess I was just kind of curious. I mean, this isn't a question that you could answer, but maybe more of a comment for thinking about going right. forward is, uh, are, are there classes of biases that are costly by your metric, but also um, ones that would be stable by uh, some of these uh, concepts uh, mm -hmm. proposed here? Yeah, yeah, including in, in your work, exactly. Yeah, so, so I think that's interesting. So we don't ask about stability of biases in the sense, sense that agents might come to figure them out. Um, 
But it's true that in some sense, this learning efficiency index, for instance, might be thought of as something that could be plugged into some evolutionary model where right, biases right. with higher learning efficiency should in the in the long run outperform uh, biases with lower learning efficiency. But we don't do that in, in the current. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Um, I have some other questions, but I'll let some others jump in so I don't hog all the time and I will uh, come back to these time permitting. Jacob, do you have any other questions? Yeah, so I, I, I just want to take partially back one of my earlier comments when I said, well, maybe if you have misspecified belief about the signal generating process, then maybe you shouldn't just take the a posteriori base optimal action. You could do something else. But of course, if you can condition your action on all signal history, you can achieve the first best. So that would be trivial. So, so that comment that I have or suggestions I have made would only make sense if there were some discipline ways of forcing people to take some summary statistics of the signal history. That's right, yeah. And yeah. now I wonder whether there is such a discipline way, or maybe you can assume that people are computing likelihood ratios, but then are free to choose something else as a function of, of, of their of that, I see. So uh, it's more than a decision bit, criteria. That sounds a little bit ad hoc. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, no, I'm just kind of thinking from top of my head whether I have uh, said something which makes completely no sense or whether there's still some way of of, of uh, turning it into a useful question. Right. I mean, if it's built into the decision criterion, um, so into how you take actions depending on, say, the empirical frequency of signals you've seen, then yeah, it would. I, I would be surprised if there were some decision criterion that allows you to robustly do better in all decision problems. I mean, for each decision problem, you can probably reverse engineer it so that you do better. But uh, robustly, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't know. Liotta, do you have any thoughts you want to jump in? Yeah, no, th yeah. That, that, that I'm not sure. I, I thought that maybe it's related to to instant points that maybe sometimes there is a limit to, to store data or st store memories and maybe that push toward introducing biases in, in utility maximization part to, to, or, or belief updating part, I'm not so sure. A natural summary statistic would be the empirical frequency. You have an mm -hmm. ID uh, process, so maybe you remember empirical frequency. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you could freely map from the empirical frequency of the history to, to an action. Then the misperceived signal generation process would be more like a loss of, of, of information than, mm. so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. We haven't, we really haven't thought along those lines, but I think it's an interesting direction, right? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, we probably have a, a time for one extra question in the official part. Is there any one who wants to ask a question? Sergio. Okay, so just uh, my uh, backup question. <laughs> um, how would we introduce in such a model the, the strength of evidence? Because uh, my intuition is that a lot of it depends on people's evaluation of the strength of uh, evidence. So mm -hmm. um, I suppose you can have repeated uh, signals and uh, put them together, but it's probably not the neatest way of doing it, right? Right. So I, I'm I'm not sure what what you have in mind with strength of evidence, but some of these biases do have that flavor. So if you're underreacting to information that might be perceived as you thinking that the evidence is less strong than actual, or also under precision where you perceive the uh, informativeness of signals to be less than than actual. That's also a form of kind of thinking the strength of evidence is, is, is less strong. Maybe you have in mind something different than that. So I know people are biased, but let's say we take them seriously. So when you ask someone, yeah. why they pay attention to that piece of information and not that piece of information, like, I don't know, mm -hmm. some conspiracy theorists, they'll, you know, they'll think for whatever reason that that particular piece of information is somehow more valuable than another mm -hmm. one. And it's, it's not about uh, whether it's a, a plus or a minus, at least, you know, like in, in people's intuitions, they like to think of themselves as not being biased towards positive or whatever. So there, uh, this is why I'm thinking about the strength of a piece of evidence. Not, not all signals have the same strength. Seems uh, right. I see, I see. 
Um, yeah, so I th maybe another, but I don't know, maybe I'm still kind of dodging your question, but another another bias that also I think is in line with, with, with what you were just saying would be something like confirmation bias, where how you perceive a given signal depends on your current belief. So if it's, exactly, if it's, exactly. if it's supporting your current belief, then you update strongly in response to it. But if it's going in the other direction, you update more weakly. <laughs> Yeah. If you think about, let's say I got I get a positive signal, and in my mind it counts as two positive signals. What yeah. Would be the end result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I think this I'm can be captured by a form of exactly. This can be captured by a form of of confirmation bias, where kind of the distortion would depend on your current belief. And yeah, we analyze that in a companion note. You can you can still derive learning efficiency indices under that and and quantify kind of the how how biases like that will affect uh, uh, learning efficiency. I think. Maybe the most uh, interesting finding there is that um, so if you if you think of uh, biases of that form, which are belief dependent, um, and so so let's say we model these in a very simple way, where um, the, the way in which you your, your perceived signal structure depends on your current belief, um, where the belief space is just partitioned into two regions, like a low region and a high region. So in each of those regions, you use different um, perceived signal structures. Then what we show is that if you compare this case where you kind of endogenously have a varying uh, perceived signal structure, depending on the current belief, to the case where you look at just an exogenous signal structure corresponding to either of those two belief regions, learning efficiency is always going to be lower in the endogenous case than in the, in the exogenous case. So in some sense, uh, things like confirmation bias will further exacerbate uh, uh, welfare relative to um, a, a, a just belief independent distortion like, like the asymmetric under overreaction we saw. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question on that? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, um, if... sorry, sorry, because so the one thing is we can oh. continue our conversation yeah, yeah. Uh, in a moment, but can we uh, thank officially Mira for, for, the, for the great talk and we will stop